Whenever I show, give a lecture, I show pictures, from, let's say, from the Hubble Space Telescope, a picture of a cluster of galaxies. I mean, the, the poetry of it, it, it the poetry, where well, we both, both talked about the poetry of science, but the, the spiritual inspiration you get from looking at a picture of a cluster of galaxies located five billion light years away from us, where every dot in that picture is a galaxy, the light from those stars left those stars before our sun and earth formed, which means that now many of the stars in that picture don't exist anymore. And if there were civilizations around those stars, each of those galaxies contains a hundred billion stars. Any civilization that existed around those stars no longer may exist. The, it, it just opens your mind to wonder. And so I actually feel very strongly that while science per se may not provide the direct consolation it can, and it should provide a spiritual, not only wonder, but it should provide a, spiritual, a consolation. Look, when we, we talked about this last night, we tell our kids fairy tales to console them. We tell them to make their life fun. We talk about Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, but then we decide that, you know what? It's better for them to know how the world really works. And it may be a little less consoling, but in fact, knowing that they're in control of their lives, actually is empowering. And many of us, if you're a good parent, you want to teach your kids how to become empowered. And yet, so, but religion, and, the, and in religion, they're often talked about the flock, the children. It effectively treats you like a child. It says, it's better for you to believe a fable than reality. And, and often when I, when I end a lecture on cosmology, I point out that one, the two things modern cosmology has taught us is that first, you're much more insignificant than you ever thought, and two, that the future is miserable. <coughs> but that should make you feel good, not bad, because it, it further it enhances exactly what you were talking about. We are so lucky to be alive today and endowed with a consciousness where we, for whatever fortuitous reasons, are on, a, on a random star in a random galaxy in the middle of nowhere, we are able to evolve a consciousness, live on a relatively quiescent planet, and so I, I actually think science can provide a real consolation by saying, look, once you accept reality, it's liberating. First of all, what you've demonstrated is that when you th thrust religion down the throats of children, which is child abuse, before they even, before they even have a, 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 a these are deep, you know, you're a, you're a man who spent most of your life studying the deep questions of theology. They're deep questions. They're not something, you know, you don't talk about libertarianism or conservative ideals to a three-year-old. But you force this down when they're a three-year-old, it's very, very diff difficult to, to abandon those things. It's very difficult for any of us who were brought up in a religious house to, to completely abandon those notions because when you're a child, you, you don't have the, the cognitive abilities, and in fact, you, you, you're, the, these things uh, just become dogma. But the other thing that you suggest, which somehow, uh, this myth that, that, you, that is pervaded by both of you, is that somehow there's this connection between religion and science. There isn't. Those, you know, there are groups that study religion and science, and they talk to other groups that study religion and science. The point is that I have been a scientist for 30 years, and I've never been not once to a scientific meeting, a scientific seminar, a scientific class where the word God has been mentioned. It's just irrelevant. As Steven Weinberg says, most scientists don't even think enough about God to know if they're atheists. Look, well, okay, I mean, it's a stereotype to suggest that people of faith are not good people. Of course, that's ridiculous. And just like it's a stereotype to say people of no faith are not good people, which unfortunately in certain parts of the world is a death sentence because of religion. Why now, is it wrong to cause pain to other members of your species? You can ask, Animals what, do that all the we can, time. We, the point is, all of these things are based on rationality. It's this, the laws of this country are not framed on Christian principles. They're cra framed on rational arguments about what causes the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people. There's nothing Christian about it or Jewish about it or Islamic about it. It's based on rationality. The too often, you're right, science does not provide meaning for people or awe or a sense of wonder. And we do too poor a job of explaining it. Science is presented, mostly by science teachers who are uncomfortable with it, as being something you need to memorize or something you need to do to make, get a better job. And, or something like that. 
science is not presented as something that provides not just a amazing ideas, but a wonderful story, a story that in fact for many scientists competes with the Bible in a very effective way, to, to, be, to be blunt about it. And the problem is, and, and I've gone to a lot of fundamentalist colleges in this country, and I think I've had more impact there when I make the simple statement that you don't have to not believe in God to believe in evolution. And the reason I have an impact there is I have students come up to me that have told me their entire lives, every single Sunday, they've heard the opposite. So the problem science has is first that we're not doing a good enough job presenting the, the awe and the wonder of science, but secondly, it is being attacked week in and week out by people who fear it. And, and, and against such an attack, the, the data has a very... When you tell people, you, if you accept this theory, you're not going to believe in God, people will turn their minds off. And young people especially will turn their minds off. And it's not surprising, therefore, that most people in this country don't believe in evolution because they've been told a lie. And by the way, that's the way I had, that's the reason I had this, uh, um, oh no, sorry. That's the reason I had this picture here, by the way. And you should go to the web, go to NASA website. This is a, not a painting, this is a picture, this is a photograph um, from Cassini of Saturn. It's a total eclipse of the sun, a scene from Saturn. But the thing that's most amazing, and this projector doesn't have the resolution to see it, if you look at this picture, in that picture, right there, you'll see a little dot, a pale blue dot, which of course is the Earth. And it seems to me that is the wonder we should be telling our kids about, showing them pictures of understanding our place in the cosmos, the earth, the center where all of our vital trials and tribulations and political battles and moral battles are being fought is that little spot, that fragile spot in a dark void. I mean, that's the kind of story we should be telling to inspire our children. And I, believe, I agree with you, we're not doing a good enough job doing it. Science changes what we mean by words. And it changes that meaning because we learn about the universe. We actually make progress in science, unlike theology. And that's because we can be wrong, and we can learn, and we learn from the universe. So if we ask the question, and I think perhaps the most offensive thing I said and it was initially at the beginning is that something and nothing are not theological or philosophical quantities, they're physical quantities. Most people recognize that something is a physical quantity, but they refuse to accept the idea that nothing might be a physical quantity, somehow the absence of something. And so what is remarkable and, and surprising in some sense how there's been a reaction to it is in this particular book, what I tried to do was, was, was not attack theological notions, but celebrate our changing picture of reality, the amazing discoveries that have been made over the last 50 years, some by people here, by my friend Brian Schmidt here, who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery that have changed completely our picture of the universe and made it plausible, the most remarkable and unexpected thing you can imagine, that you could start with absolutely nothing. That means, unlike the Cardinal said, and unlike some people argue, no particles, but not even empty space. No space whatsoever. And maybe even no laws governing that space. And we can plausibly understand how you could arrive without any miracles without any need for a creator, without any supernatural creation, you could produce everything we see. And I find that the fact that it's plausible, <coughs> remarkable, in the same sense that I think people, I found it plausible when I first learned about evolution. The amazing fact that the diversity of life on Earth, which seems so designed and complex, could arise from so simple a beginning. Human beings were clearly programmed by evolution to impute intentionality to the world around them. Meaning and purpose was infused in all everyday events to make sense of a dangerous, difficult, and uncaring world. So we had rituals behind the sun, the moon, the planets, the wind, the earth, the oceans, in all societies. The rise of our physical understanding has slowly caused us to do away with those many gods. We no longer have Mars, the god of war, Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea, the Thor, the god of storms. As Michael has said, Everyone here, or maybe everyone, is now an atheist respect, with respect to those gods. And there's a reason for that. Science has taught us that instead of capricious beings, there's an order to nature. And that order does not appear to involve a divinity. It, there's no need for a divinity. Laws of nature, describable by mathematics, make predictions that allow us to not only predict the future, but control it without the need for any supernatural shenanigans. And in fact, it amazes me that uh, the asking the question, is God necessary, is somehow an evil thing. 
When we stop asking questions, that will be an evil thing. Science has taught us also that we want to believe, in the words of Fox Mulder. And we should be skeptical of, the, of those desires. As the physicist Richard Feynman told us, the easiest people to fool are ourselves. As scientists, we have to train ourselves to be skeptical of wanting to believe. And we should try and overcome our natural tendency to assume special significance to events. And human beings are also inevitably programmed to ask why, as we've heard it. But the why question is ill-posed, because it presumes purpose. It presumes the answer to the question before you ask the question. What if there is no purpose? Does there need to be purpose? And science tells us there's no evidence of purpose. So the why question is ill-posed. Our opponents want to keep the clock from ticking by avoiding the evidence of reality. And therefore, science, by telling us there's no need for purpose, has refuted the need for God, and that's why you should support our position.